we found that oysters are far more dynamic in the way they choose a habitat. Very simple little organism before it settles down, but it does have a rudimentary eye, so it uses light a little bit. It can smell, it uses olfactory cues, so that it can smell other oysters. And what we've discovered, and what a lot of our research has centred on of late, is that oysters can hear. Dr Dominic McAfee is an award-winning marine biologist from the University of Adelaide whose interests have led him to conduct groundbreaking experiments deep beneath the ocean waves. These reefs are a kilometre offshore, eight to nine metres of water, murky water a lot of the time, a bit sharky from time to time. <laughs> so chasing speakers each week to try and keep playing music to oysters, it sounds insane, it is a little <laughs> insane, but as it turns out, it works really well. Hi, I'm Professor Andy Lowe, and today we'll be taking you to the ocean floor where environmental restoration efforts are transforming our coastal habitats for the better. Join us as we learn what it takes to bring back habitats that have been lost for decades and answer an age-old question. What type of music do oysters prefer? This is the Discovery Pod. Dom, welcome to the Discovery Pod. Thank you, Randy. It's a pleasure to be here. You're a research fellow in marine ecology based in the School of Biological Sciences. And I guess we hear a lot about the threats facing reef systems, but you don't work in the Great Barrier Reef. You work in some of the other reef systems that we have in and around Australia. So tell us a bit about those reef systems and what kind of challenges are they facing? Mm, the relatively unknown reefs. Uh, there's <laughs> the, much, dark reef. the dark reef. <laughs> there's much more than coral reefs out there. But when you talk about reefs, people immediately assume that you're talking about coral reefs. But the world is much bigger than the tropics. And we have <laughs> fantastic reefs all around our temperate coastlines, which compose the majority of coastlines around the world, formed by all sorts of habitat forming animals and plants. You have macroalgal reefs, you have sponge reefs, you have many different types of reefs, but I'm particularly interested in shellfish reefs. That's reefs that are formed by oysters and mussels. And there's a bit of a problem at the moment because we've pretty much scraped them all from the sea floor. There are very few shellfish reefs left in the world. They're probably the most decimated marine habitat worldwide. And in Australia, we're down to something like less than 1% of the historical distribution that we had 200 years ago. Wow. So in 200 years, we've decimated our reef system. So hang on, you said something there around habitat forming organisms. So a reef is basically a home that's been made by a plant or animal to live in. It's like a little house in the, in the ocean built by a plant or animal. The trees of the sea. The trees of the sea, yeah. or they, even the little, the little village in the sea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and although we think of, for example, an oyster as quite small relative to a tree, an oyster is enormous relative to a little amphipod, a crab, small fish that live in amongst the nooks and crannies created when you get many, many, many oysters and mussels all living together, when they aggregate and they can grow off the seabed and historically quite high. You had shellfish reefs that were four meters high mm. and would stretch for kilometers at a stretch. We had something like 7,000 kilometers of these shellfish reefs around the Australian coastline, a network of reefs which provided the dominant habitat in all of your temperate, your cool water bays and estuaries all around Australia until European settlement. So uh, uh, these are the critical habitats. So most of our kind of uh, shore uh, inhabiting uh, marine biodiversity would have or still lives uh, in these kind of reef systems. So you're, you're probably emphasizing just how important they are as reserves for mm. biodiversity. Mm. Yeah, think of them as the, the foundations of productive ecosystems. If mm. you have 
If you chop down all the trees in a forest, you're going to transition to a grassland habitat or something with far less physical complexity. Yep. So essentially you have fewer niches, fewer habitats, fewer organisms, less productivity. Yep. And it's, not, it's no dissimilar in the sea. These ecosystems, these reefs formed by shellfish and other organisms, would have provided the foundations for communities that spread, would spread far beyond the actual reef footprint. Uh, we think of these reefs as the natural fish factories of the sea because fish breed and grow up in amongst the oysters before they graduate to uh, offshore habitats. Mm. So with the loss of these this reef ecosystem, it's quite hard to fathom how productive seas would have been because of this thing called shifting baseline syndrome where we think of the health of the environment, the state of the environment, as what we experienced as children and as we grew up. So we, we struggle to comprehend what ecosystems were like hundreds of years ago or even decades ago. Yeah. So we, we've got these, or we had these reef systems, incredibly diverse uh, systems. And then over the last 200 years, they've been decimated. 99% of shellfish reef systems have been removed. And yet, you know, most of us weren't alive at the point where those systems were first starting to be removed and decimated. So how do we know? How do we know what was there? What records can we rely on? There are inklings in the oral histories of, of some of the stories that have passed down, but a lot of those oral histories passed down through generations. A lot of those oral histories have been lost. They've certainly been lost from common social knowledge. Of, of late, we've been using historical fisheries records and particularly valuable are maps which show where these shellfish reefs were. Now, those maps were typically only being created when the fishery was in decline. When, we, when these oyster reefs were starting to be removed and they had to suddenly regulate them. So we have maps from the late 1800s. Prior to that, there was, there was, a, it was a bit of a wild west for shellfish harv harvesting. People were pulling shellfish reefs out of the coastline all around Australia. Hmm. So it was the need to regulate that led to mapping of the early reefs. So we have a few examples. Most of those maps have been lost but a few examples which show that reefs covered entire gulfs, thousands of kilometres squared, and they're all gone now. Australia once had native oyster reefs along 1,500 kilometres of its coastline. Overharvesting in the 1800s resulted in the collapse of these reefs, removing a vital ecosystem and its many associated benefits. Since then, shellfish reefs have been functionally extinct, which means their numbers are so low that they can't play their function in the ecosystem anymore. In the 60s, the scallop dredges got to work. Within decades, the reefs were fished out and gone. Looks like a, a ghost town on the seafloor, or it's just a wasteland. The reefs were wiped out last century by overfishing, pollution and disease, leaving marine deserts off our major cities. We could walk out to the deep water, go and get a bucket full of fresh oysters. Everything was in plenty, but not anymore. Australia's shellfish reefs once stretched along the coastline from Noosa to Perth, serving as crucial foundations for thriving and diverse marine ecosystems. It's alarming to hear that less than 1% of this once vast natural environment remains. But for someone who's studying an ecosystem that's been functionally extinct for years, Dominic is energised by the opportunity. So how do you restore something that no longer exists? Is it even possible? So, you know, we hear a lot that uh, extinction is forever, and obviously extinction is forever. But if you still have uh, viable populations of the marine plants and animals, then it is possible to restore some of these communities. Is that right? That appears to be the case. And it seems that the sea is particularly resilient to destruction, given the opportunity. If we give the sea marine communities a chance to come back, we have seen them flourish and bounce back really quite quickly. And a great example of that is uh, Bikini Atoll, where they detonated, I think, 21 atom bombs <laughs> in the 70s, effect effectively removed an entire island's seascape. 
just leaving craters. And that's a pristine coral reef nowadays. We think of wow. coral, coral reefs as, as slow growing ecosystems, but Bikini Atoll, because humans stayed away for a long yeah. time for a good reason. <laughs> Might uh, have had high mutation rate, but yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Wonderful four ride fish. But now it's a thriving marine ecosystem, and we're hoping to recreate something with shellfish reefs and, and making good incremental early progress. Mm. So this is a massive challenge, right? Mm. So you've, you've had very diverse system been removed over uh, decades and decades of kind of high impact activity. So where, where do you start with a, a restoration program of this type? Sure, you know, you've got to pick the right location. And it's probably not just what you do in the sea. It's also getting support from the community, getting mm. uh, funding. So, you know, where do you start with this type of program? Mm, that's a great question, because as an ecologist, you think you start with the oysters or the substrate <laughs> <That's right. laughs> or whatever it is, but the process has to start much earlier than that. Mm. And social and political and financial support are absolutely key to getting meaningful restorations in the water. So for the uh, our contemporary restoration program, it started with the historical ecology and just building that knowledge mm. among communities that now live along these coastlines that were formerly characterized by shellfish reefs, but no knowledge really exists. And sharing that knowledge is one of the most exciting parts of my job because it's such a phenomenal story and people feel like they have a strong connection, particularly in South Australia, where the vast majority of the population lives on the coast. Lots of people love to go recreationally fish each each weekend or whenever they can. And people have a strong affinity. There's a strong coastal culture in South Australia. So knowledge that these coasts look fundamentally different, mm. that their functionality, their productivity, their shape, the sound the, was very different not that long ago is quite exciting realization for a lot of people. So really exciting to share that. So where do you start? You start by generating support hmm. and interest from multiple sections of the community. And that's long before you even start to think about how you're going to bring back the individual organisms. I guess you must have some some inkling that you can bring it back before you start a large scale one. And also this sense of restoring pride back into the coast and what could be there. It's a very powerful motivator. Mm. It's not fear. It's not de depression. It's pride and hope, isn't it? And that's a, a real feather in the cap of this story, because although it's quite devastating when you hear the scale of loss, that loss isn't associated with contemporary mismanagement. It happened a couple of hundred years ago. So nobody's, there's no sort of <laughs> risk averse. There's no premiere that's going to be uh, uh, holed up in front of the media yeah. on this one. It's yeah. a good news story. <laughs> essentially, people are excited <laughs> at the opportunity to start to bring these lost ecosystems back. And there's inklings that, that tell us that we can do it. We have a thriving oyster aquaculture industry in the state. We produce some of the most delicious oysters anywhere. The oysters grow really well. So it tells us that the the conditions are still ripe to support thriving marine communities. Oysters on leases composed of tens of millions of oysters, much like a reef. So that's a good indication that conditions are suitable for us to try to bring these ecosystems back. But when we started the journey, we had no idea whether or not we would have any natural oysters recruiting to our restoration sites, finding them and settling on them. And that's the key component for beginning the ecological process of bringing these reefs back. Yeah. Okay. So you've got community support. There's no minister going to be fronted up and blamed for anything. It's a good news story. You know, everybody can get behind that. So where, where do you start? Where do you start with the actual work in, in the water to restore the systems? So historically, these reefs were composed of oysters on oysters on oysters. You know, other oysters provided the bedrock for for regenerating reefs. But what we did, the reason why we lost them is that we just overfished them really intensely. There were other there was environmental change as as coastal as catchments uh, were changed, and that changed sediment runoff and water quality. But most significantly, it was this dredging of the oyster habitat, removing every single oyster indiscriminately of, of their size and either eating them or, or burning them to manufacture lime, which was really important for the early European settlements to manufacture cement. So essentially, you've removed every oyster and you've shifted from this hard bottom shelled habitat to a sandy seabed. So the first step 
to bring the oysters back is to provide suitable hard substrate. And how yeah. we do that is we build boulder reefs. We use limestone boulders and we lay them at a suitable depth in the seafloor, not too shallow that a kayak is going to stumble over them, not too deep that they're going to get in the way of any fishing activity. So kind of Goldilocks yeah, uh, sweet kind zone. of zone. Yeah, yeah. And you talk a lot about oysters. Are these the Pacific oysters that we, we know and love and eat here, or these are another species of oysters? This is the native flat oyster. I should have said that up front. The Pacific oyster, which everybody loves, is actually native to Japan and uh, other parts of East Asia. And as we destroyed these fisheries all around the world, the favorite oyster was introduced, and that happened to be the Japanese Pacific oyster. So if you're at a restaurant and you order oysters, the vast majority of times you'll be eating a Pacific oyster. Mm. We're restoring the native flat oyster, which is a bit of a different beast. It's got a different flavor. It's not a lot of people wouldn't don't enjoy it quite as much as they enjoy the Pacific oysters. But there's a small commercial industry around them where they still exist. And bringing back those native oysters is valuable to recreate the historical native ecological associations they had with other native species. So you've built your boulder system, mm. limestone boulders, set out the hard substrate so the oysters can, can settle. Is it that easy or do they need a little bit more help? Sounds easy. It does, isn't it? <laughs> you make easy. it sound so Everyone easy. Everyone should Tom. do it. Uh, first... In fact, just go out and start throwing rocks in the sea. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 don't no, do that. No, don't, okay, do that. Sorry. don't do that. Uh, <laughs> because when, when it was announced that these reefs were going to be built, uh, there was all sorts of requests. Oh, why don't we sink some old train carriages? Or I've got a, I've got a bunch of old car bodies. And that's historically what people used to do. People would throw washing machines. They probably still do. Off the back, off the back yeah. of their boats, yeah, to create any hard structure. So first you need to know where to put them, of course. Using those historical maps is very, very helpful. You can also look at different environmental conditions that are suited to these oysters. Uh, we learn a lot through the ac oyster aquaculture industry in terms of what conditions they like, then you need to get your timing right. You need to understand a little bit about the life history of these oysters. When are they, if they are recruiting, when are they recruiting? But then you've also got to help the oysters find the reefs. Hang on, find the reefs? Before we get to why Dom thinks oysters need to stop to ask for directions, let's pause to unpack exactly what an oyster is. Oysters are a type of saltwater bivalve mollusk, essentially a small fleshy animal enclosed by two hinged shells that live in the sea. While they seem to be born from the rocks they grow on, oysters actually start their lives as microscopic larvae, no thicker than a sheet of paper. It takes an oyster at least 18 months to reach a size suitable for eating, but believe it or not, they're not just good for a Christmas lunch. Oysters have an important role to play in our marine ecosystems. They're natural water filters, removing algae and sediment and other impurities from their surrounds. In fact, an individual oyster can filter up to 150 litres of water every day. That's two bathtubs per oyster per day. But before they settle down and form the filtration factories that are oyster beds, oysters float through the ocean as larvae, looking for a place to call home. Hence, their need for directions. That was the historic perception that these were just sort of passive drifters moving about in the water column and just serendipity where they would settle. Hopefully, they'd settle somewhere suitable. And for some marine larvae, that is the case. But we found over the last couple of years, doing all sorts of crazy experiments, we found that oysters are far more dynamic in the way they choose a habitat. As they get close, they actually have a tiny, these are brainless invertebrates who, you know, very simple little organism before it settles down, but does have a, an eye, a rudimentary eye. So it uses light a little bit. It can smell, it uses olfactory cues so that it can smell other oysters and if one oyster is living there, it's probably a good place for me to live as well. And what we've discovered and what a lot of our research has centered on of late is that oysters can hear and they can actually sense or feel or hear sound and follow that sound back to its source. Wow. Hmm. That little 160 micron thing with no brain. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Evolution's phenomenal. <laughs> 
Yeah. And how, how does it then track the sound? How is it able to follow the sound mm. if it can't swim? Mm. Well, one of our first inquiries is, can these oysters swim? So okay. we've been playing with flat oyster larvae produced from time to time for aquaculture. And we can easily just go and ask for a few thousand to play with because they produce millions. And we built something that we like to call the Oyster Raceway. It's an <laughs> eight meter long tank in our aquarium. And we would place the oysters in the middle of this tank, put a speaker at one end, playing healthy marine sounds, nice marine soundscapes, the natural sounds of the sea. Mm. And on the other end, would also there would be no sound. It would make sure that that sound degrades by the time it gets to the middle of the tank. So it's essentially a simple choice experiment. Which way do the oysters want to go if they can go anywhere? And every single oyster that moved from the entry point actually swam towards the speaker, which was quite a phenomenal finding because what we already knew is that oysters would dive when they hear a sound that they like, a suitable sound. They could dive to the seabed, presumably to then find that source and settle near it. Mm. But this was the first time anyone had shown that oysters will actively swim over meters. Mm. And remember, this is a tiny microscopic organism, which is able to actually eject what will become its mouth as a little larvae. It ejects it outside the body and uses it as a bit of a propeller, a mm. little cilia beating water to, <laughs> to slowly swim. So never underestimate nature, really. No. So what, you, what sounds? What, what's, the, what's the sound of a healthy reef? Are we talking Mozart? Or are we talking <laughs> Iron Maiden? Pearl what Jam. Are, what, are, yeah, what are we talking? <laughs> yes, we have the marine soundscape, as we yeah. call it. It's, it's composed of all different components, uh, both living and non-living, waves crashing, thunder rolling in the distance. But the biological component seems to be what's really valuable to a lot of different animals looking for a place to live. And that's composed of all sorts of different critters just going about their daily lives. But in particular, there's one culprit, the snapping shrimp. They're the lead chair in the ocean orchestra, if you will, <laughs> because they create this incredibly loud snap. They have this modified claw, which shuts so fast that it creates an air bubble. And as that air bubble collapses, it's a really sort of physically violent process in miniature. It creates a little flash of lightning, but also this tremendous wow. snapping sound. It's a very, very loud snap. And when they aggregate in the thousands or millions, as they do on healthy reefs, that sound can be quite an intense crackling sound. And if anybody's snorkeled or dived on a healthy reef, be it a coral reef or a cold water temperate reef, they will have heard that intense crackling associated with that habitat. And that's what a lot of different organisms are keying into and following back to the source. Wow. It's a real voyage of discovery, isn't it? It's a lot of fun. It's incredibly engaging. And when I first promoted the research through social media, I didn't mention what music we were playing. I just said we're using ocean music or something like that to attract oysters to our restorations. And the Twitter sphere at the time <laughs> lit up. It went relatively viral, not, of course, in the Taylor Swift sense, but in the science <laughs> sense. It went viral as people were getting excited about what sounds are they playing? You know, is it a blue oyster cult? <laughs> um, you got a, a range of corny suggestions. <laughs> oh, you? many, yeah. <laughs> many. And, and they were bitterly disappointed when they actually heard the reality. But So uh, now you've talked it up. Let's hear it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it, it, it is engaging. <laughs> So this particular soundscape we actually recorded at Port Nalunga, on the outside of Port Nalunga Reef. That has about the noisiest soundscape that we've recorded anywhere in Gulf St. Vincent. And we've recorded sedimentary plains and seagrass sounds and restored reefs, degraded reefs, healthy reefs, and played all of those sounds to oysters. And it's these uh, the more intense that, that reef soundscape, the stronger the response you get. So you get more swimming oysters and you get more oysters settling down. This is a great place to live. And mm. then once they're down, they're down for good. They're mm. down for life. So it's a very important decision. So they're using all sort of environmental cues that are available to them, light, smell, sound. But sound seems to be particularly important because it moves independent of ocean currents as opposed to smell. 
and it can travel a really long way, up to half a kilometer from the actual source. Right. An oyster is obviously not going to swim half a kilometer, or maybe a super oyster, but <laughs> but we understand that this recruitment process is far more dynamic, and they can regulate their height in the water column, they can swim up and down, and they can swim left and right to access currents and, and tidal activity to get closer to that sound. Mm. So you didn't have a cage of shrimp. How did you make that sound in the water? Mm. Mm, that was that's one of the the really fun parts. We've actually been constructing our own speakers, our homemade speakers, marine speakers. Commercial ones are available, but they're not really compatible with our science budget. Uh, so, <laughs> so you, 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 you see, can... they're far too cheap and uh, inferior. Yeah, 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 that, okay, that's yeah, right. Yeah, so yeah, we need yeah. something A grade. Uh, <laughs> you'd be looking at about uh, four to five thousand dollars all with all the components. But we need to replicate this to make sure that what we're doing is is scientifically sound, and we're really detecting the effect of what marine sound does for recruiting oysters. So we started to build our own speakers, and we did that in collaboration with an environmental NGO, a local one, Oz Ocean, who are a bunch of fantastic engineers who are interested in technological solutions to support the environment. And with them, we co-developed a underwater speaker using all off-the-shelf parts. So we popped down to Bunnings, got some PVC pipe, over to Repco, a few car batteries, and jumped on eBay and got these really cheap speakers and computer components and were able to construct our own speakers for just a few hundred dollars. Mm. And then deploy them right, right across All the across the reef, yeah. 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 So we'd have a few batteries in there, and the most painful part of the, the research is we, we got about five to six days battery life out of our speakers. So that's something we need to work on. It just meant that we were continually swapping over speakers, having to go out. And we're, we're talking about uh, these reefs are a kilometer offshore, eight to nine meters of water, murky water a lot of the time bit sharky from time to time. <laughs> so chasing speakers each week to try and keep playing music to oysters, it sounds insane. It is a little <laughs> insane. But as it turns out, it works really well. So you've solved the problems. You've got a range of support, both uh, research support and community support. How many meters of oyster reef are you starting to restore? In South Australia, we're leading the way in terms of reef restoration. So uh, I described that amnesia that nobody knew that we had these these shellfish reefs over 7,000 kilometres of Australian coastline. And that was just still in 2015. Hardly anybody knew. And from a small scale pilot about the size of this table, you know, a few metres squared in 2015, the first modern day shellfish restoration project, we're up to about 60 as of last year. And South Australia has put the most hectares down. We are currently at about 40 hectares mm. of shellfish reef. So that's many, many thousands of tons of limestone that have gone down. Windera Reef constructed in 2017 was is the, the largest shellfish reef restoration in the Southern Hemisphere. It's a 1.1 kilometers of coastline, 159 individual reefs, some mm. of them 30 meters long. And we have tens of millions of oysters that have recruited to those reefs. And just a few years ago, we had no idea whether or not the oysters would be out there. These reefs are completely gone. But there are individuals out there, here and there, and found no substantial natural habitat out there. Just an individual attached to a, a razor fish shell, attached to another organism here and there. And it must be those that are seeding this this now large-scale recovery. And some of the reefs are looking fantastic. Uh, the one at uh, Glenelg, just off the Glenelg foreshore, about 900 metres offshore, looks like it's going to be one of the great conservation success stories for marine restoration anywhere in the world, potentially, because we have brought back a functionally extinct ecosystem back to life within a few years. Mm. 
out here at Windara Reef, a site where we're restoring 20 hectares of native oyster reef uh, just off York Peninsula. So we as scientists are great at bringing all of that information together, but it's imperative that we have passionate people on the ground actually implementing those plans. The shells have been collected from local restaurants and pubs, sterilised, then washed by hundreds of volunteers, before being placed into handmade baskets ready to be dropped into the bay. To be the liver of our bay, to see the life in those oyster baskets after such a short time, amazing. The winner of the 2020 New South Wales Environment, Energy and Science Eureka Prize for Applied Environmental Research is rebuilding Australia's lost shellfish reefs. Heaps of different benefits can come from this, as well as this really fantastic connection to the country, or Gorua, from the Warramai people. We can just keep doing this and take it at a time. Eventually we'll have something fantastic again. So extinction is not forever, and with the right approach and some funky underwater speakers, uh, you can actually <laughs> uh, reverse the process. <laughs> but one of the great conservation success stories globally, really, for and it would also be fair to say that you've probably inspired a lot of people to actually do similar types of activities around the Australian coast, not just here in South Australia, but elsewhere as well. Yeah, ab absolutely. And all states are involved. All states have some reefs now in the water. And uh, this research was you know, recognised for that national scale collaboration with a, with a Eureka Prize back in 2020, which was very exciting early recognition. And since then, it's just kept growing up. National level, it's been about $40 million invested, including a $20 million investment from the federal government three years ago, which went to the Nature Conservancy, who really pushed this national agenda forward. But that's just Australia. And in, for example, Europe, there's 16 countries that are now pursuing oyster reef restorations. They've also lost all of their oysters. And it's fantastic to be speaking to that community and also to have them keeping a keen eye on what we're doing down here because they're not quite at the reef building stage yet. They're getting very close and they're making great progress. But we dived in a few years ago and we're learning as we go. But the early signs are very, very encouraging that we can bring back a pretty substantial portion of these lost reefs. So if you were to have a very large grant award uh, awarded tomorrow and you had 10 years of, Ooh, of recent, wow. oh, 10 years, 10 years and completely oh, funded. I've got goosebumps. I know. <laughs> so in 10 years, when you look back, how will you make history? What really excites me is seeing broad engagement from the community in restoration. And, and I would like to make history by creating a restoration culture essentially, where coastal residents engage in restoration projects as a normal part of the weekend. They'll go down and contribute to a local restoration project. And I really see that as a way of synergizing, energizing the restoration space. At the moment, we have these large-scale projects, these big reef projects going in with barges and cranes dropping thousands of tons of limestone. But what would really excite me is to see this broad scale engagement. So with 10 years and, <laughs> and unlimited funding, certainly there'll be a big marketing campaign about telling people to get down to the coastline. Go snorkel. Go, go snor snorkel. Yeah. Go eat some oysters and yeah. then use those shells to start to repair the reefs that, uh, that, that we've lost in a responsible manner, of course. <laughs> Well, Don, thanks very much. It's been a very inspiring story. And thank you for being on the Discovery Pod. Oh, it's been a lot of fun and uh, absolutely my pleasure. In this incredibly inspiring tale of reversing humanity's degradation of the environment, two things stand out for me. First, the level to which these shellfish reef restoration projects have captured the imagination of coastal communities right across Australia. It's amazing to see people so passionate about a marine environment that hadn't even existed in their lifetimes and stands as a shining example of community engagement with science. Second, the work that Dom and his team have done gives us a glimmer of hope in the battle against habitat loss across all environments. Thanks, Dom, for joining and inspiring us. And thanks to you as well for listening. 
If you enjoyed this episode, leave us a review, rate us five stars. And while you're at it, why not share this episode with your friends and family? In our next episode, Dr. Lewis Dunnigan talks to us about transforming our waste into worth using activated charcoal. Around the time that there were so many issues with Australia sending waste plastics overseas and the recyclers were dealing with a lot of contamination problems, we did sort of think about, well, our process may be viable for those types of plastics. A fascinating chat breaks down what activated charcoal is, its applications to industry, and provides a valuable insight into how to commercialise research. In the meantime, if you have a topic that you think we need to explore, you can get in touch with us at podcast at adelaide.edu.au. We'd love to hear from you. I'm Professor Andy Lowe, and you're listening to The Discovery Pod, brought to you by the University of Adelaide. So, what do you want to know next?